Hebrews chapter 6 this morning, and we will be um, starting with a verse of scripture uh, in chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. Uh, We talked last week a little bit about Abraham uh, and how his faith was counted as righteousness. The first point was that we had to, we have the profound comfort of the person of God. This I find amazing. As we mentioned last week, we have this profound comfort uh, from our loving Heavenly Father. Now, I have to be honest with you, uh, I very seldom felt comfort from my earthly father. (laughs) Uh, Very very seldom did I feel this comfort in the things that we're going to talk about with my earthly father. Uh, He was flawed like we all are, but he was specifically flawed in the area of alcohol and alcoholism. And that makes for a different family, if you know what I mean. And if you come from a family like that, you get me. You understand what goes on in that way. So when I began to first hear about this loving God, this loving Father, I was like, what was that? (laughs) A loving Father? You mean this God doesn't drink and get drunk and get mad at me? That I, he's not going to say one thing in the middle of the day, and then later on after he, he gets drunk, he's going to say something totally different? This is not going to happen with our God? I can trust this God? This was amazing news for me. This was comfort that the words of God are true and real. Amen? They're not made up, or they're not platitudes. They're not just something I say because I grew up in the church and I learned how to say them. I did not grow up in the church. You know, I was 16 when I found the Lord, as you know, and when that happened, it was profound to me that there was a God, and He loved me, and He cares for me, and He's going to make a way for me in, in a place that I didn't think there was any, any room for comfort, any room for Him to make me feel better about my life and to feel good about life in general. But when God comes in and God tells you things that you've never thought of or heard before, we need to listen to them. We need to hear those words. As I mentioned before, that uh, speaking in tongues and all the things that our church was doing when I first became a Christian, I had no idea what that was. Never even heard of the concept at all. But I heard these words ringing from people in the congregation from time to time, and those words were like, like speaking right into my heart, something I absolutely needed that was so amazing to me, I had to pay attention to it. We have the profound comfort of the person of God. In Genesis, we heard the story of Abraham when we talked about it last week, how he went up on the mountain. And Abraham had a child of promise. His name was Isaac. And he was going to go up and he was going to, uh, the, the plan was to go up and sacrifice the child. But I pointed out last week that the language was so specific. Abraham was going to take his son up there to do what he thought God was asking him to do was sacrifice his son. But he said to his servants that were there, the two that were helping him with all the horses and getting up there and all the things they were gathering for this this offering. And he said, okay, guys, you stay here. We will be right back. Well, who's we? It was him and Isaac. But wasn't Isaac the one that he was supposed to sacrifice? So he thought, but he was also the child of promise and God's word is true. And he thought, okay, no matter what, guess what? I'm going to go up there, but we'll be right back. We... Not one that's going to be left on the altar, but we're going to be both be right back. And they were, weren't they? They were because God spared him. But I was thinking of this this week. What if God didn't spare him? What if he didn't stop here at the knife and he just didn't hold it back? What if he killed him? Is that such a big deal for God to raise him from the dead? No, we'll still be right back. I love that about God. Don't give up on him. Amen? Don't give up on what you know is true in God's word. I don't care what the world's telling you. And by the way, they're telling you a bunch of stuff. All right? They're telling you a bunch of stuff that's not true and it's not real. Okay? There are things that people are representing in our world today, even about God, that are not true and not real. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I could raise, ask you to raise your hand at one point in time. I could do that because I know it will affect many of you, but uh, keep your hands down. I don't want you to feel embarrassed or burdened or anything like that, but how many of you have ever been hurt in church or by people in church? We all have, right? We all have. I've been hurt by my wife. There she goes. She's walking out of my message right there. See that? That hurts. That hurts. <laughs> I've been hurt by her. Do I say, okay, that's it. I'm done with you. Watch, man. <laughs> Thank you, baby. Thank you, baby. I feel better. 
I feel better. She was giving Ben some, some stuff to do in church. Hi, Benny. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you. <laughs> Hi. How are you, buddy? Oh, man. <laughs> Only Ben Hur can tell you that. That's Ben Hur. There. I've been hurt by my family. I've been hurt by my best friends. I've been hurt by some of you, and I'm sure I've hurt some of you. But you know what? It's okay. We don't just get up and walk away. We, we recognize that God is going to help us. But I want to, what I want you to know is it's not that, that God has hurt us. It's I've hurt you or somebody else has hurt you. It's not God. Don't complicate it. And don't uh, put all those things together like, oh, and the world is telling us, oh, the church is this, the church is that. Listen, the church is full of people. We mess up. God does not mess up. If you've been hurt in the church, it's not by God. It's by either a false expectation of God or the way that some person represented God to you in a way. Probably by a person in church. That's okay. But remember this, that it is not God's work to hurt us. Okay, thank you for that one amen. I'm glad I got that. It's not God's purpose to hurt us. He does not want to hurt us. He's all about helping and healing and moving us forward and us progressing in our life for him in such wonderful ways. I love that. I love Megan's story about uh, Logan and Brooklyn this week on Lent and how they gave up a screens and they gave up playing with toys. And it's like they're going, this is hard. <laughs> this is hard. I can't even watch you play with toys. I don't have screens, but I can't even watch you play with toys. It's like, what do I have? And it was like, this is going to be hard. But at the end of it, was it Brooklyn that said that? At the end, Brooklyn is saying, but it's going to all be worth it. I was like, oh, man, that is awesome. Could you come and teach that to all of us? Because we need to hear that. Because it is going to be worth it, whatever it is that you're sacrificing. What I say, so-called sacrificing. For a kid, that's major sacrificing. Okay. You know, for you, you, may, you maybe you gave up broccoli. I don't know. Um, I, you know, I'm sure you gave up some really good things, some really things that are going to deepen your life because that's what Lent is about. It, it's this, this relentless pursuit of God, as we call it, relent. It's a relentless pursuit of God. What am I giving up that's going to help me in my pursuit of God? And believing that God is who he says he is is number one in our hearts and our lives. And no matter what it is that you give up, that you sacrifice, that you say no to for the next 40 days, it's going to be something that's going to work in your favor because you're going to gain from God. What do you, our, our Lenten uh, equation is, is what is it that you're going to have multiplied in your life by focusing these 40 days on the things that God is telling you? I love this time of year. I love it because it is a time for me to refocus, to recalibrate, to realign if I need realignment, and see and sense what God is doing in our heart and in our life. And I think it's a beautiful time, and I want to encourage you to embrace this God who is a God who is full of comfort and being able to help us. So our, our second point of this message is we have the profound comfort of the promise of God. Not just the person of God, who again won't hurt you, will help you, will move you forward, but we have the profound comfort of the promise of God. So look with me in verse 16. It says, people swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to his heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that the two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, uh, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. I thought that was great, but let me read in a different version. This is the New Living Translation. Now when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, the oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. This is a profoundly comforting to me, that he will not change his mind. You know, I'm not a divorce and marriage, a divorce and family therapist. I'm a marriage and family therapist. I am a marriage and family therapist because I believe in the institution of marriage. But I also believe that we're people and we have difficulties and we get at odds with each other from time to time. All of us know this and recognize this. But I serve a God of hope and a God of comfort that helps me that and he will never change his mind. Uh, I, I wanted in every way that I could to, to bind Sandra 
to this agreement forever. Okay? Forever. And I wanted her to say, she wouldn't say it, no, she might if I asked her, but I wanted you to say, if I fall out of love with you, I die. Because you are my nutrition. You are my life, you know. I wanted something so solid, like tap, tap, no erases. You can't get out of it. You are in this, and that's it. There's nobody else you're ever going to find better than me. But she wouldn't say that. But she did say, I promise for all of my life to love you and only you till death do us part. Now, I was right here doing a wedding for a couple, right here. And right on the fly, the vows were changed. <laughs> it wasn't saying, um, so long as we both shall live, it said, as long as we both, as, for as long as we both shall love. And I was like, blah, 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 blah. what? <laughs> I mean, I was like, okay, wait, 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 wait time out. You know. <laughs> so if you don't feel love, okay, then it's okay to break the arrangement, to break the covenant, to break the oath. Alan, I'm sure, Megan, not, not because she's not the sweetest thing on earth, but I'm sure at times you don't feel great love for her. Not often, but once in a while, there might be something. You know, Joe, I don't want to get you in trouble. Your wife's not here, but, you know, Dave, you lean over to kiss her. She's got a mask on. That's just not even fun. <laughs> we all understand this, but we make an oath. We have a God who cannot lie. We have, and we want to feel the promise of God, the comfort of the promise of God. I want to feel the comfort of the promise of Sandra till death do us part, no matter what. You know, so we even made these things for richer, for poorer, because I never had the richer, so you're going to have to get used to the poorer. For sickness and in health, I've always been healthy, but you know, I might get sick. You know, for all of these things that we, we kind of, it's almost like a caveat. You know, we put it in there and say, hey, no matter what, here's what we're going to do, right? And you hope that that's going to help. And the scripture is saying, listen, and without any question, the oath is binding. God also bound himself to an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. He would never change his mind. I'm so glad I serve that God who will never change his mind. I grew up with a father, as I mentioned, who changed his mind all the time from sober to drunk, and that mind was left and right. It was black and white. It was totally different from what he said earlier. I have to tell you, I hate that. I don't make a promise most of the time in my life. I am very conscious of the fact that if I make a promise, I'm standing by it because I know what it's like to have a promise breaker. I love the movement of the promise keepers you know, in the 90s. I love the movement of the promise keepers because, like, that's who we are. People were promise keepers. Amen? That's who we are. That should be something that people count on with us. We are promise keepers. So is God, by the way. So God has given both his promise, and then he gave something more than a promise. He gave his oath. So I swore in front of a bunch of people in 19, whatever it was, with Sandra at the church that we were at. We got married there, and I made all these promises to her. And I said, till death do us part in all of these things. And I, I believed that they were, and I made them in front of these people. So I've told couples before, listen, how many people at your wedding? Maybe say 100, 300, 500. Okay, so if you want to break this oath, you have to go to every one of them and tell them what you're planning on doing and get their blessing because you made a promise in front of them. Hello. Now, if we did that today, divorce rate plummets. It goes down. You can't even find half those people anymore. But you got to find them. Thanks to Southern California, my hometown, where they made this thing called no-fault divorce. Used to be you had to prove something that that person was a bad person, they've committed adultery, have done something like that. But after California, they said, no, no fault divorce. Oh, no biggie. Eh, whatever. 
come on. This was an oath you made in front of hundreds of people. You understand, oath I was, the reason I keep bringing up marriage is I was trying to think of what oath do you give? I mean, when I took my, my driver's license, they told me what the rules are, but I didn't take an oath that I would always follow those rules. <laughs> I knew what the speed limit was, and I knew what my foot likes to do. And it is not saved. That foot is not saved. Because it will go faster than I'm allowed to go. You know, in the old days, not so much now. You know, for the most part. Unless I'm late to Gardner and I have to rush there. You know, I wish I had that cheater thing that beeps when the police are around. But I think that's unrighteous, people. <laughs> Just kidding. Two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge. <laughs> we fled to him for refuge. We can have great confidence as we hold on to the hope that lies before us. Why did God make an oath to Abraham? It was certainly not because God was unreliable that he had to make an oath. He already made a promise. But now he's making not just a promise, but he's making an oath. And by the way, he made a promise to you, and then he sealed that with an oath by the death of his son Jesus. Do you think God is serious about the oath of your salvation? About the oath of giving you what you need on this earth to succeed and to prosper and to be people of righteousness, people of faith? He gave you everything you need. He gave a promise, many, many promises, and he took an oath by the blood of his son Jesus. That's amazing to me. If you were a Pentecostal church, you might get excited about that. Amen. Thank you. It was certainly not, again, because of God's unreliability. It was the oath was due to the sinfulness of man. Because we, God knows we're oath breakers. God knows it. I can remember one time being pulled over by the police. And when they got to the window, he said, Pastor Bob, <laughs> do you know why I stopped you? I was like, you needed some prayer? <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure I did something wrong. <laughs> Isn't that a loaded question? Do you know? Why are you asking me, do you know? They want us to recognize what we did wrong and tell them what we did wrong before they give us a ticket to enforce what we did wrong. <laughs> it's okay. Pastor Bob, do you know why I pulled you over? Yes, because I'm a sinner. <laughs> and I need help. And... Uh, you're laughing because you all need that same kind of help. But the oath was because of our sinfulness, because he knows what it's like. We know that we break oaths, we break truths, we break pacts, we break promises. We do it all the time because we're human. But God calls us to something greater. He calls us to be oath takers, to receive the oath and the benefit of that oath, to make the promises and make our word and our promises true. Philip Hughes rightly comments about this. He says that God should bind himself to an oath is a reflection not of the divine credibility, but on the perversion of the human situation. He's recognizing that, yeah, we need sometimes these oaths. So we have this thing in our family. It's called word of honor. Word of honor is something that we hold in high esteem. We don't say swear to God. Uh, we say word of honor. So on our honor, we'll say, and the kids will do something, and I'll say, word of honor? And they'll say, yeah, Dad, word of honor. Or I'll say, hey, we're going to go to Disneyland. And they go, word of honor? Because <laughs> they know it's, it's good. I, if I say yes, it's going to be true. You know, sometimes I've tried to fake them out saying, word of honor? <laughs> and they go, no, 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 I, I got that, Dad. Word of honor. Is it word of honor we're going to Disneyland? Yes, word of honor. We're not going to lie on word of honor. It's a seal. It's a pact. Should you need a seal or a pact? Well, if your dad's a joker like me, yeah, you do need that to make sure you're not going to go along with this and feel dumb in the end of the story. But the bottom line is that we, in our word, it's our bond, but we say word of honor. That seals it. That makes it true, and we're not going to lie on it. As a matter of fact, one time when Heather was in college, uh, I got a call from somebody, and I said, did she say word of honor? She goes, she said word of honor. I said, well, then that's the end of it. Case closed. That's all. She said word of honor, then that's true. He said, Pastor, do you know how many people say to me word of honor? I go, I don't know. But this one, if she says word of honor, absolutely true. Count it, take it to the bank. She's not going to lie on it. Bobby's not going to lie on it. My grandkids aren't going to lie on it. Because this is something that we say in a way that proves the intent of our heart. And it's really, again, it's about our human situation that leaks in sometimes. Abraham already had God's promise 
And in Abraham's mind, that was probably good enough. But we see that Abraham did not ask God to swear to him. God chose to do it as an encouragement to Abraham. He wanted to help Abraham really understand that, listen, through you, I will make a great people a great nation. The strength of the oath is found in the character of the one offering it, as well as the value placed upon the oath. So it depends on who's giving you that oath as to whether you believe it or not. If a habitual criminal makes an oath, you probably will discount the reliability. But if he makes an oath in the Bible or swears to something uh, that he holds valuable, then you have more cause to believe them. For he'd be saying, for instance, if he were lying, then the Bible upon which I swear is a lie. Or if I'm lying, then the deceased mother upon which I swear is a liar. The degree that you value and esteem the basis of your oath, to that degree, your word can be trusted. So for instance, if, if some of these people gave you an oath, would you believe them? If this guy gave me an oath, uh, would I believe him? No. I'll just tell you, no. I don't have to think about it. No, I wouldn't believe him, OK? How about this one? Jim Jones. 900 people in his church died because he lied. He's not trustworthy. He hurt people. A generation of people were left stranded. I, I wouldn't trust him. But he's got that collar on. Doesn't that legitimize him? No. Always ask questions. How about this guy? Ted Bundy, serial killer. Hey, you need a ride? <laughs> no, I'm not going to believe him. But what about this guy? This guy, is, I cannot tell a lie. That's what we know him from. Who chopped down the cherry tree? I cannot tell a lie. It was Joe Cunningham. <laughs> no, I cannot tell a lie. It was me. I, I, so we, we pretty well think he's reliable as somebody. Of course, look, you can't. No, he can't lie. It's baby Yoda. He learned it from an early age, people. I would trust whatever Yoda says. I would not really, but let's just say I would. How about this guy? See, I, I looked and searched on my computer for pictures of Mother Teresa. Go to the next one. This is what came up with Mother Teresa, that one. But look what also came up. Back, back to that one. Jasper came up as a Mother Teresa figure because he's wearing his Mother Teresa outfit. <laughs> he still wears it, Jas don't you, Jasper? To be honest, you still wear that Mother Teresa outfit, don't you? I believe whatever that kid says. Yes, you know I would. How about Mother Teresa? I mean, that's somebody that, you know, she gave her whole life to people who were hurting. And people who, you know, see, the reliability of those people bring us to understand that this is someone that you can trust. But why would God swear? Why would God swear on something uh, more valuable uh, than himself in order to give comfort? He did it for us to help us. When a witness takes the oath in court, he is, on, he is confronted with the, the word, so help me God. This is the greatest witness that we can call on. None is greater than God who swore to himself, like, kind of like, so help me me. You know, it's like, I will do it. Uh, that song that we sang this morning, there has never been and there will never be a God like you, a God so true. Oh, man. God cannot lie, folks. This is what I love about God. I can trust him. I, even with things that are higher than me, I can trust him. I didn't know what this speaking in tongues was all about when I got saved, but yet I did it, and I didn't even know what it was. It was amazing. It's something that I'm like, I don't know. I just felt it was okay. And it's a weird thing, but it was okay because it was God's word said it. They showed me all over the Bible where that was happening. I said, okay, then it must be true. Why? Because the word of God is reliable and trustworthy. When we prayed today for you and with you, we prayed to a reliable God who we know at first, no matter what, will hear your prayer. I love the, the way someone said one time that I pray and God always answers. He doesn't always answer what I want, but he answers. And he answers not on my time. I love those scriptures that say his ways are higher than my ways. Mm, could your way just be like my way for a change? Can we just have the same way? How about that? He goes, yeah, Bob, can we have the same way? I want to ask you the same question. 
I'd like your way to be the same way as my way. I written all down, Bob. You can't miss it. Look at it. It's right there. I'm like, oh, you're so smart. You think you're so smart, don't you? Oh, yeah. I'm the essence of smartness. Okay. You may have a 4.0, but I have a 10.0 <laughs> or a million point oh. I mean, come on, this is God. This is amazing. But we have this God who comes into our life that changes everything about us and turns us over and around and says, I have something good for you, plans for you to prosper and to succeed. And we always say prosper, we're talking about money. No, we're not talking about money. Prosper in money is a relatively new Western thing. But prosper in the things of, if you had 10 children in the old days, you were very wealthy. <laughs> but you were also very poor because you had to feed those 12 kids too. But you were very wealthy. Wealthy in the sight of the Lord is a man who is blessed by God, who a man or a woman who walk in righteousness by God. This is the essence of prosperity. I am so thankful that God has seen fit to take my old life and get rid of it in a way that is like it was not useful to me. It was not getting me anywhere. It was taking me down. And God said, I got a new life for you. And you're going to love it. Buckle up. It's going to be a ride. And I'm telling you, it is a ride. It's wonderful. We are called by God to believe what he says and to recognize that God has good intentions for us, for us always. God could go no higher than swearing to himself, taking an oath to himself. Nothing can even remotely come close to the exceeding uh, value of God's word and how precious and wonderful it is for us. In verse 18, God's purpose is given as an encouragement to lay hold or to take hold of the hope that is set before you. Thank you. The hope that is set before you. I don't care. I live in a cynical, cynical world. I fight cynicism with every breath I take, almost. It feels like that to me. I told Sonny the other day, I'm tired of fighting this stuff. You know, you, you, you have natural, na natural kind of cynicism that comes from New York or Los Angeles. And uh, it's a natural cynicism. You know, you don't trust anybody or anything. It's just the way it was on the West Coast. You never trusted anything. You know, I, I, I have a hard time sometimes with this cynicism, and I fight it all the time because God is not cynical. You know what I'm saying? You tracking with me? God is not cynical. We are cynical. The enemy is cynical. <laughs> enemy in the garden. <laughs> Did God really say that? No. No. You know, this cynicism of, uh, I know what you heard God say, but that's not really what God said. Isn't that crazy? Isn't our world telling us that all the time? You guys are crazy. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, I'm a God crazy, and that's a good crazy to be, I guess. But I am I'm crazy in the best way possible towards what God tells me. When God says, hey, hey, Bob, in the middle of Los Angeles doing nothing uh, but serving him. He says, I want you to move to Overland Park, Kansas. I go, where's that? Why? You know, I have all kinds of questions, but I heard the voice of the Lord. It was, you know, my questions and my, my wondering were just me talking out loud to God because we get to do that, don't we? We get to ask God, did you really mean that? And he said, yeah, I really meant that. I want you to move to Overland Park, Kansas. I go, why? What's there? There's no beach there. I can't surf. I, I don't know. Do they have sidewalks in Kansas? I, can, I got a skateboard somewhere. What am I going to do? He said, you're going to go to Kansas, and you're going to go to Overland Park. Now, we drove through Kansas, all of Kansas, to get to Overland Park. You have to drive through all of it. Can I tell you, I was scared from the point I left that line to the point I got to just about Johnson County when I thought, oh, okay, this is not bad. But I'm telling you, that was scary. It was like this, nothing, 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 a little bit of a hill, oh, a silo, oh, five buildings, that's a town, and then nothing for a long, long time, and then, and it's like that kept going on and on and on. I kept getting more worried and more worried. It was like every time I crossed a silo, I was going, oh, oh, <laughs> this is not getting better. Where does it get better, Chicago? I don't know. I'm looking for it. And then I got into this lovely area. 
And I said, oh, well, this, this is doable. I could probably do this. I can see Kansas City. It's right down there. It's a whole city right over there. I can do this. But you just, you don't, you just listen to what God says and you just do it, folks. Honestly, that's a big decision, isn't it? I mean, my kids were not for it in the sense of, yay, let's leave L.A. and let's go to Kansas, where we've never been before. They've been to third world countries that they thought was probably better than Kansas. They've just never been there. And they were in high school. That's a good time to relocate, huh? That's a good time to get the kids to say, hey, you want to move to some place you've never been in a way, in a land that we don't know? Uh, no, Dad. I don't even want to change schools. I don't even want to change my neighborhood. But when God says it, guess what? I trust him. Why? He's trustworthy. What is he saying to you today? Do you believe him? Please do. It's trustworthy. Now, it's good to get another opinion because the Bible says that there is wisdom in the counsel of many. That's a good thing. But everybody I asked about whether I should do this said, nope, you're a so cowboy. You do not want to go there. They called it flyover country. That is ridiculous. But I have to tell you, folks, it's the best place I've ever lived. Because I got to find you. And we found each other. And my daughter found Jeremy, and my son found Julia. You can't do better. So this is awesome. The promise of God goes with you wherever you are. So here's the question. Where are you? Where are you in your journey? Yeah, right here. I like it. You are here. And that's no accident. Can I just tell you it's no accident? You just wake up this morning and say, oh, I think I'll go there. God has a plan for you. Something that we are saying today, either by a song or a prayer or a special message from God or this message or something, God has you here to hear something today. You say, well, Pastor Bob, I'm here every week. Yeah, and every week you get to hear something from God every week. Are your ears open? Maybe you're using Q-tips to clean your ears and just pushing that earwax all the way in. You can't hear anything. I don't know what the problem of hearing is. I want to hear from God. I know my problem in hearing. I'm going, nah, 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 nah. I know you're going to ask me to do something I don't want to do. I don't want to listen. I don't want to listen. <laughs> That's my problem. I don't know what yours is. But we all have a problem. It's called flesh. It's called sin. And when we deal with that, we hear God better. Sin is like earwax. You can tweet that. It's all right. Sin is like earwax. Here, I'll give you a TikTok. Hey, sin is like earwax. Okay? Thank you. I'm for all social media, every platform. I'm with it. I'm on it. Uh, on the Facebook. I'm on the interweb. I mean, I'm there. But here's what I understand. And I really, truly know this. I mean, I am old. <laughs> I am 65 years old. You know, I came here and I was the youngest presbyter. Now I'm the oldest presbyter. How does that happen? <laughs> but it happened. <laughs> and I'm here. But I'm old. I've seen some stuff. I've seen some junk. I've seen some garbage. I grew up in the 60s in Southern California. Do you not think I saw some weird stuff? I saw some of the weirdest stuff you've ever seen in your life. And then when I met God, he asked this question. Do you trust me? Do you trust? I said, I don't even know you. <laughs> I just met you. Do you trust everybody you first meet? No. <laughs> She's not from Kansas either. <laughs> She's got that island cynical. <laughs> it's a different cynical, but it's still there. But understand what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a God who wants us to trust him and says, you can trust me. I want the best for you. I am trustworthy. And he's speaking to you even now. What is he saying? Where are you? Where are you in the process of being able to hear from God? Is there too much junk going on? That's what Lent is about. Let's strip away some of the stuff that takes us away from God. 
I love it on my phone when my phone says, hey, Bob, you are down 11% on your apps, on your reading, on everything you do on your phone. You're down 11%. Can I tell you that's a victory for me? I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. Thank you, Lord. And I can't wait to see what it's going to be at Lent. When I get done with Lent, how much it's gone down. Because, you know, sometimes it crowds in my life and, and, and gets me in a place that I don't need to be. Now, it's not that there's something inherently bad on it, but sometimes some of the posts from some people that I love and trust makes me feel like I can't trust them anymore. Hurts me. But I can't wait for that just to be stripped away even more. And I'm very cautious and careful. But I want it to be stripped away. But here's what I was wondering. I said, God, can you put an app on my phone that tells me how much my communication, my thoughts about you are and how much they have gone up this month or this week? I want that app to tell me how I'm doing. Because you know, I, I need to be reminded of that sometimes, don't you? Don't, don't I? Yes, I do. I think it's wonderful that we serve a God who doesn't punish us and says, hey, you're not spending this much time, therefore, you're going to a bad place. That's not God. He just looks at us and says, hey, you know what? I'm particularly fond of you. And I know you can do better. You want to? This is God's voice. Yeah, let's do that. He's not like the preacher I heard this week, good friend of mine that said, hey, there's two places you can go when you die, smoking or non-smoking. <laughs> That's kind of, it's kind of harsh, kind of harsh. It's reality, but it's harsh. <laughs> I know Gary's going to use that again real soon. He'll go out and witness somebody just to use that line. But I hear Bob Ross, now where are you going, smoking or non-smoking? All of us. Have a God who doesn't come to us harsh and angry. He comes loving and caring, even when you mess up. Oh, oh, man, I love that about God. Now, I know I've done wrong. I know I've done wrong in his sight. Does he keep bringing it up like my mom used to over and over and over again? No. He tells me once. And it's a God who loves me, who corrects me. And guess what happens? It changes me let it change you for the better you've heard me many times talk about the progressive movement of God I see it in scripture all the time but can I just tell you this God has a progressive movement for you in your life as well Hallelujah. pastor Dave has been my associate pastor for more than a quarter of a century because he's old too I love and I trust what Dave is going to say, but I have seen Dave go from scruffy McConnell, no, to McConnell uh, light, <laughs> to McConnell deep. I've seen the progressive movement of, of Dave and Nancy's life in some wonderful, miraculous ways. These are servants of God, people. They are servants of God. I've seen them grow in maturity, in knowledge, in wisdom, in ways that is amazing and beautiful. And that happens to every one of you. I've seen the same thing in you. I continue to see it in you. God has you on a progressive movement towards him, towards health and righteousness. He has you there. And if something is going on in your life that messes with you, I have to tell you something. Life messes with you. What do you do with it? Give it to God. He's going to help you in that. He's going to find a way to bring that to something good for you and healthy for you so that you can stand from the, what the, the, the scripture calls the wiles of the enemy, the schemes of the devil that he has against you. God is here to say, listen, I am for you, not against you. And if God be for you, who therefore could be against you? The answer to that question is rhetorical. is no one. Because he made an oath to you, a promise and an oath. Signed, sealed, delivered. That's it. End of story. Trust in it. Walk in it. Everybody I've ever seen that is really disillusioned with God is because they stopped trusting him through the difficult times. Through the very difficult times. 
I remember the first time I ventured out of this state, I was going somewhere in Nebraska where Gary's uh, family was and one of his folks had passed away, so I was going to their funeral. And I'm driving up, up, up. I just kept going up, up, up. I, again, more, more of these you know, silos, <laughs> more of these things going up, 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 getting more and more terrified as I drive. And I'm like, I, I must have missed it. There can be nothing north of this. I can probably see, you know, Russia from here. I don't know, but it's, I'm going nowhere. And I, and I turned around. I got, I got a little bit like weirded out. So, and this is before GPS and all the other things. I turned around and I got off the next exit and I stopped at the gas and I said, where is this town? How far away is it? And he said, it's just the next exit up. You just turned around one exit too soon. <laughs> oh man. How many times have you turned around too soon? You were going this way, you're trusting God, you're having faith with God, you're, you're going right and you're listening to him and all of a sudden you stop and turn around and retreat. And God says, no, 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 just a little further, keep going, keep going. There it is. Because God is working in your life. He's working for your good and for your benefit, which is also his good and his benefit. Absolutely. He's put you on a course of your life. When did it start? When you found Jesus. When you found Jesus, it started. And it's continuing. And it's going on. And it will go on for a long, long time until one day you stand in eternity with him. Ah, oh, can you imagine? You stand in eternity with him and you get to see the promise fulfilled ultimately it's a wonderful thing but even more than all of that he has resolved to give you greater encouragement so that you might not give up that you might continue on but the promise made is only as valuable as the one who makes it and that's god so we are meant to be encouraged by his promises we're meant to be encouraged by his promises you see abram had a promise of a son and even though his wife and him were so old that when they said they're you know you're going to have a son they laughed they laughed <laughs> we're like 90 how can we have kids we, we can't have kids we're past the time of kids it's not going to happen ha 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 so then they turned around too soon by thinking well i'll just get another wife or another girl and i'll you, and that, that didn't work out well. Because when God gives you a promise, just trust it, just walk in it, and don't turn around too soon. Abraham and Sarah turned around too soon, didn't they? And then they had to go back on the track and then listen to the promise of God. And then a promise came, an oath even came with it. And God came through as he always wills because he is God. And last thing this morning, for it is God who makes the promise and it is impossible for God to lie. Okay, I can lie. Now, you may not like that. Your pastor can lie. What? Yeah, I can lie. I don't want to. And I will try not to, ever. But I have the ability to lie. God cannot lie because he is so true and so righteous and so real. He cannot lie. It's a concept we can't understand. This is what the scripture calls the mystery of God. Don't try to think about it because it'll, it will break your brain. It will break Einstein's brains to think about it. He couldn't even get close to thinking about it, nor can you. When we try to process it intellectually, it doesn't make sense. That's because we see it from a human perspective, not from a godly perspective. I mentioned Dave, if Dave told me he was going to do something or if I asked Dave to do something and he said, yes, I know it's going to happen. Because everything I've asked Dave to do, he's done. He's faithful. What about your promises? We make them and break them a lot sometimes. That's not our best foot forward, but it happens. Does God give up on you? Never. He said it this way. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Because he said, I do, and he did, and he does, and he will, and he will continue. Here's the bottom line. You can have complete confidence 
in the sufficiency of Christ and the gospel. For the God who has promised to save you and to bring you home to heaven cannot lie. Isn't that great? We used to sing this song in the old days. You've heard me quote it many times, one of my favorite songs. I have decided to follow Jesus. Remember the rest of that? No turning back. And we say, yeah, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. You've got to say it twice. <laughs> no turning back, no turning back. And then we add another verse. This one is a hard one. Though none go with me, still I will follow. The world behind me, the cross before me. This is deep theology, folks. It's all we're talking. I should have just sang that song and we could all go home. That's the message in a song. No matter what happens, I have decided to follow Jesus. I don't care. And I can remember the first time I said this, someone said, Pastor Bob, you ought to knock on wood. When you say that, I go, what are you, a voodoo Christian? <laughs> That's voodoo Christianity. I got to knock on wood. I have decided to follow Jesus. I don't care what's going to happen. I don't want to test the theory out. I don't need a lesson in theory. I've read Job. I know what that's about. I learned that lesson with Job. Okay. I'm just saying I have resolutely set my mind towards Jerusalem as Jesus did, and my Jerusalem is heaven and God himself. I have resolutely set my mind to that. I don't care what they discover in archaeology. I don't care if they discover the fact, you know, that Jesus uh, was over here and when he said he was over there. And all. It doesn't matter to me what they say because I know what God has done in my life, and I know where I was going and it was not non-smoking <laughs> I knew where I was going and I needed him to save me aren't you glad he saved you and by the way he saved you for a purpose there's a reason why you exist isn't that great wow there's a reason why you exist hallelujah let's bow our heads in a word of prayer first let me ask you a question maybe this morning you found yourself turning back a lot of times instead of pushing forward. Maybe you've been hurt. Mm. As a psychologist, I see that the people that are the most the most messed up in their minds are the people that have been hurt. Because hurt is deep, folks. That's why the Bible says that the word of God pierces even to the marrow, even to the, to the bone. The word of God gets into where nothing else. He's saying it this way, your hurt is very, very deep, but I can get you to a better place. I can heal that hurt. I've given my son for that hurt. So I get that. I've been hurt. You've been hurt. Maybe you especially feel it right now. Because everything gets kind of emphasized and bold and underlined in our lives when we have something like a pandemic going on. Some kind of turmoil or junk in our lives. It can mess with us really bad. And then when things happen that normally we would be able to sort out, we can't sort them out because we're hurt too much and we have other things. Our bucket is full. And that's what Jesus said, the greatest psychologist that ever lived, the one who made us and knows how we tick, says, lay your burdens down, cast your cares upon me, for I am strong, I am able I can take it. Maybe you turned around too soon. Maybe you find yourself turning around a lot. That's okay. Guess what? You're in a progressive movement of God. He's not done with you. He's not mad at you. He loves you with an undying love. Maybe you grew up doing all the right things and you thought you were doing everything right and still you felt hurt. Folks, we're in a world that knows how to hurt and an enemy that wants to do nothing more but to hurt you and get you to turn around. That's what was happening in the book of Hebrews. 
We've been studying it for months now. We're finding that these people were weary and tired. Maybe you are too. Let's surrender ourselves to the progressive movement of God. Let's surrender ourselves to God's work in our lives. Hmm. So maybe you're here this morning and you got some hurt. And you say, Pastor Bob, I'm really glad to hear these promises and this oath that God made to us and I can count on it, right? And I say, yes, you can. But first we just have to say yes to God. It doesn't mean you say, well, I'm already saved. That's great. But even though we're saved, we can still say no to what God wants in our lives. So maybe you're here this morning and you just need to say yes to God for whatever it is. I don't need to know what it is. If you're here and you just say, I need to say yes to God more, just raise your hand, put it up, put it down. Let's see it together. Amen. Because we're making kind of a commitment together. Amen. So we had three people raise their hands. And can I tell you that when I was praying about this message, in my, in my heart, I, I saw more people responding to that, more people responding to their hurt, and they need to give that over to God, and it's hard and scary. But if you need to do that today, just raise your hand. Put it up, put it down. I want to see it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, that's more like it. Father, we cry out today for my friends my family here, I cry out, Lord, that you would help us, God, because we are hurt. We have been hurt and bruised by this world. Promises were made and broken. Things were said and unsaid. Things have changed the trajectory of my life in some ways, and I need to get back on track. Lord, I thank you that even through the hurts that I have had, and I've had some big hurts, that you have always been faithful to be there in my hurt. You've always been faithful to be there through the tragedies, through the circumstances, even the ones that I cause myself by disobedience or by not listening, by doing my own thing. Even then, Lord, I found you in that healing, loving, encouraging place where you always are. May we as a church be more like you and be healing and be kind and be restorative and redemptive. May all the work that we do be that way. May everybody that comes in here, whether they like us or not like us, whether they believe or don't believe, may they feel your love in this place always. And Lord, keep us on that progressive movement. Father, I thank you for the hands that were raised. And I know that there are others this morning that did not raise their hands. And I discern in my spirit that there are those who need to respond to you. They don't need to respond to me. They need to respond to you. And they will. Because, Lord, this week you're going to show them how much you love and trust them. And how much they can love and trust you. Because your words are true. And it's impossible for you to lie. So thank you, Lord, for healing. Thank you, Lord, for your word, no matter how we received it today, through prayer, through song, through a message of tongues interpretation, through the message of your word, through this closing prayer, through the words of the people around me that will greet me when I leave and say something perhaps that I need to hear more than anything else. And you are not done talking to us. You are speaking to my friends at home. You are speaking into their living rooms right now. Because their living rooms, or wherever they are they're watching, is now a tabernacle of the Lord our God. And that we are all tabernacling together. Whether we be in this room or not, we are tabernacling together. In the spiritual sense, we are the church, united by a single purpose and care and love. So God, grant us all these things. We love you, we thank you, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you, folks. Let's stand together. Let me pray this prayer of blessing over you. Father, thank you for my friends. I pray that their week will be blessed by you. I pray that the words of their heart, Lord, will be heard by you, God, that you would help them and teach them and continue to uplift them. Lord, may you be with us the rest of this week, Lord. Every day, may we find greater pleasure as we, as we have this season of Lent, this relentless pursuit of you. 
May it be God honored by you. And may you, Father, speak into our hearts and thank you for what you're doing. And for these blessings, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Folks, God bless you. Be safe. Hopefully we'll see you Wednesday night on Zoom. If you need an invitation, talk to Miss Sandra. She'll get the invitation to you. God bless you.